Hello and welcome to City Club of Boise's Marilyn Schuler Human Rights Forum. I'm Karen Sander and I'm the City Club Board President. I'm pleased to kick off today's program and have just a few details to share with you. First off, this conversation could not be more timely as we pay our respects to the great Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who worked tirelessly for the rights of all and especially for women. I would also like to thank the Planning Committee, Jennifer Johnson, Sue Rance, Catherine Himes, Julie Robinson, and Russ Heller, all supported by our club manager, Morgan Keating. Please note that you will not have video or audio from your computers. We'll only be hearing from our speaker and moderator. I want to welcome our radio listeners who will be joining us at a later date via Boise State Public Radio on KBSX 91.5 and its affiliates throughout Southern Idaho and Northern Nevada. This program is being recorded for our radio broadcast and will be available um, on YouTube next week. Today's forum is available in large part because our City Club partners and sponsors. I would like to take time to thank them for helping us achieve our mission to ensure compelling conversations, engage citizens in a dynamic community. City Club of Boise received grant funding from the Idaho Humanities Council which is a state-based affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. In addition, the Grove Hotel, Boise State University School of Public Service, St. Luke's and Perkins Coie are sponsors of today's program. Our premier sponsor is Northwest Nazarene University and the NNU College of Business. We also receive support from our forum series sponsors, AARP Idaho, Bank of Idaho, Climate Tech Corporation, Echelon Group, Micron, Pacific Source Health Plans, and Small Mind Development. Thank you to our media partners, which include Boise State Radio, Public Radio, 670 KBOI, Idaho Statesman, Idaho Public Television, and our university partners, U of I, BSU, and NNU. Finally, many of you attending today made donations during registration that will support student attendance at this program and forums in the future. Our sincere thanks for your generosity. Following our speaker's opening remarks, there will be an opportunity to respond to your questions. You can use the Q&A function of Zoom, just type in your question, or you can email morgan at cityclubofboise.org and it'll be provided to her immediately. Our moderator will do their best to present each question and may group some inquiries together in the essence of time. Without further ado, here is today's moderator, Marsha Franklin. You may recognize Marsha from her day job as the host of Dialogue, an award-winning discussion program on Idaho Public Television, and her new project, The 180 with Marsha Franklin. Marsha was a founding member of City Club back in 1995, and she served as president in 2012. And she was a close personal friend of Marilyn. So with that, Marsha. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm really so pleased to be moderating this event on a number of accounts. First, I've admired our speaker, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, for decades and have had the distinct privilege of interviewing her quite a few times, both for television programs and newspaper articles. Each time, I've come away looking at a seemingly familiar story in a new way, which is just one of Professor Ulrich's gifts. I know today will be no exception, both for me and for all of you listening. Second, as mentioned, this forum is named in honor of my mentor, Marilyn Schuler. She was a longtime City Club board member as well. And I have no doubt that if she could break away from whatever book club or philanthropic deed she's involved in up in heaven, she'd be grinning ear to ear at seeing who is headlining her talk today. Marilyn admired Professor Ulrich so much. In fact, in homage to that, I have with me Marilyn's own copy of A Midwife's Tale, for which Dr. Ulrich won the Pulitzer Prize. Thanks to Sue Rents for lending this. And one of my favorite photos of Marilyn addressing students in Coeur d'Alene is right behind me next to another book by Dr. Ulrich. The only thing better would be if Marilyn could be with us today. And finally, the topic of suffrage is one I've studied a bit this past year as a contributor to the Idaho Public Television documentary, Ahead of Her Time, produced by my colleague, Jenny Sue Weltner. Like most Americans, I grew up knowing absolutely nothing about the fact that the Western states, including Idaho, 
led the way for universal suffrage in our country. Now that I do know, I become quite aggrieved when that part of the story, that essential part of the story, is omitted over and over, including in recent national celebrations of the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Our speaker today is the perfect person to help rectify that issue. Professor Laurel Thatcher Ulrich is renowned for bringing to light the lives of women who haven't received their due, like the midwife Martha Ballard. But as with the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose legal acumen was a bit overshadowed in recent years by the RBG moniker, so too has the awareness of Professor Ulrich's scholarship sometimes taken a back seat, so to speak, to the bumper sticker phrase she unwittingly coined, well-behaved women seldom make history. But that popularity has also helped draw attention to her groundbreaking research on women. That's research that has garnered Professor Ulrich some of our country's highest laurels, the Pulitzer Prize, the Bancroft Prize, the MacArthur Fellowship. And although she moved to the rarefied East Coast six decades ago and eventually taught at one of its storied institutions, Harvard University, the bedrock for her interest in women's lives was formed right here in Idaho. You see, Laurel was raised in Sugar City, Idaho. And to adapt the famous adage a little bit, while you can take the future professor out of Sugar City, you can't take Sugar City out of, well, you get the point. Because Professor Ulrich is from the Intermountain West, it shapes her historical lens in ways that allow her to perceive things in the record that others might not see. And today she's going to use that lens to help us understand why the West might have passed women's suffrage earlier than the rest of the country, and also shine a light on some of the women who worked so hard for that cause. As always, your questions are integral to the event. If you have one, as mentioned, you can just type it in the Q&A box on your screen. Please keep it as brief as possible though, because each question has to be cut and pasted by our manager, Morgan, into another message to me. So please help out my old eyes and keep your question to the point. But this is a fantastic opportunity to get the thoughts of such an important historian. And I dare say she might entertain a few questions on our current state of affairs as well. She's a good sport that way. So without further ado, I present Professor Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Hello. I hope that I'm there. Did I press the right click on the computer? I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I so looked forward to being here in April and sorry that I, the pandemic got in the way of that. But there was um, an advantage, at least for me, and that is having several more months in sequestered in my own home, I was able to dig much more deeply into my own state's history than I had been able to do before. I have been working um, pretty regularly on preparing for the centennial of women's suffrage but had not given particular attention to Idaho. So this has given me an opportunity to uh, improve on my scholarship and I'm happy to share that today. I also want to give a great big thank you to Hannah Laura Hine of the Idaho Historical Society and, and Patricia uh, Lynn Scott of Blackfoot, uh, a retired historian of some of great um, achievement, of each of whom helped me find materials that were otherwise unavailable given the circumstances. So I would now like, I hope I can do it, I would like to share my screen. And I hope that uh, did what I intended it to do. Unfortunately, you know what? Here we go. 
think it's there. So you can now um, look at a few slides rather than my aging face. I'm going to begin with um, one of my favorite documents in women's suffrage. It's a 1915 cartoon that was published by the New York humor magazine, Puck, in celebration of a coming referendum on women's suffrage in New York State. And it shows what is clearly a representation of the Statue of Liberty on an unbroken string of Western states. She's left her pedestal and moved west. And strangely, the eastern half of the United States appears to have sunk in deep black sludge. And it's filled with anxious and frantic women. I love showing this cartoon to audiences in the East. Although a few people know that Wyoming was the first territory or state to grant women the vote, hardly anyone knows that all the first successes occurred in the West. They unfolded in stages. First in Wyoming and Utah in 1869, and 70, when both were territories. Then, four stars in the suffrage flag with Idaho planting the fourth star in the 1890s. And then finally, between 1910 and 1914, a clean sweep for the West. Professor Ulrich, can I, I, I don't uh, want to interrupt the train of thought there, but we can't see your slides. So I'm wondering if you We're and I can- We're not seeing the slides? No, and I wonder if you and I can work together to make that happen for our participants. Do you see the screen? We practice it and we know you can, it's there. So um, do you see the share screen um, button? Um, uh, I will now try that. I'm, okay. I'm so sorry. That's okay, that's all right. Um, you Great job describing them, but um, it'd be super to see them as well. So okay. yeah, share screen well, button um, here. What, okay. Okay, there we go. We're seeing that if you can just um, pull it up in the screen, perfect. And then you can go back to maybe the first one, uh, which you described so well. Here we go. Uh, oh, this is all what right. we always worry about, those of us who are... That's, that's okay. <laughs> it, we've got it going. Okay, there we right. go. So First here's the car cartoon. Suffering. Yeah, maybe re-describe re re this. Yes, if you could re-describe that, I think that would be great. Thank you so much. There's the slide with Lady Liberty in the West and those miserable women in the East. There's the timeline, first in 1869-70, then in the 1890s, here's Idaho up here in 1896, then the clean sweep between 1910 and 1914. Okay, we're now all oriented with dates, which of course really matter in history. So what's going on here? Why the West? Well, a political scientist uh, has argued that two factors were crucially important, political competition and suffrage mobilization. Idahoans weren't less sexist or brighter, or wiser. They just were able to take advantage of a particular moment in time when they were able to bring to fruition ideas that were widely shared in the nation. As a native of Idaho, 
I like to think of this vibrant woman in the flowing yellow cape as representative of the free spirit of the West. But as a historian, I have to admit that much as I love this Puck cartoon, it is also deeply deceptive. It imagines the West as a place apart, disconnected from what was happening elsewhere. In fact, suffrage victors in the West were highly dependent on national politics. And they were made possible because intrepid suffragists in other parts of the country were willing to go West to help facilitate things they had been unable to achieve in their own homes, partly because politics was so locked in. Think blue state, red state. It's really hard to make change and very hard to expand an electorate when there's little competition between parties. So let's think for a bit about how suffrage unfolded in the West. Yes, there were those victories in Wyoming and Utah, but even though people tried hard, none of them went very far because the circumstances weren't right. But individual women were able to act wherever they happened to live. And in the West, two important women's rights newspapers showed up in 18... 71 and 1872. You know about Abigail Scott Dunway in Portland, Oregon, who spent time in Idaho and had a profound influence on raising awareness of the movement here. But also Emmeline B. Wells, the longtime editor of the Woman's Exponent, which became the longest lived women's rights newspaper West of the Mississippi. But you know, Western territories were deeply invested in complex process at the national level that had occurred as Congress turned its attention, and this is really important, Congress turned its attention from the unfinished work of racial justice in the South and took on the project, a more appealing project, of exploiting the wealth and the supposedly free land of the West. And in their terms, that project was about civilizing racial and religious minorities. Both projects mattered in Idaho. The federal census of 1870 counted 14,999 inhabitants, 28.5% of whom were Chinese. It was also the homeland of Nez Perce, Shoshone, and Paiute peoples, some of whom refused to be happy on reservations. Adding to the state's racial problems was a serious gender imbalance. In the rich mining areas of the state, 75 to 100 percent of the population was male. Only in the growing Mormon settlements in the southeast was there anything approaching a normal gender balance. And that brought its own dilemma. Why would you want to enfran enfranchise Mormon women? It will simply increase the population of a minority that people despise. When Mormons began to win elections for public office in Oneida County, the trouble began. 
And the state's newspapers through the 1870s and 80s are absolutely filled with references to what the San Francisco cartoon calls troublesome children, Chinese, Indians, and Mormons. Idahoans gave the War Department responsibility for its indigenous inhabitants, but it heavily lobbied Congress to do something about the other groups. And in 1882, Congress passed in the same session and with overlapping sponsors, the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Edmunds Anti Polygamy Act. It's not surprising that anti-Chinese violence escalated in Idaho in the 1880s. What is more fascinating is the way Idaho accelerated the assault on what it called uh, iniquity among the Mormons. An enterprising U.S. Marshal named Fred Du Bois helped to engineer something called the Idaho Test Act, which not only disenfranchised polygamists for the crime of polygamy, but disenfranchised anyone who affiliated in any way with an institution that condoned it. In a sense, they disenfranchised all voters who wanted to remain affiliated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In 1887, Congress um, increased, its prefer, pre increased its pressure on Utah. Women there had been voting since 1870, thinking this could, would help they disenfranchised all women, whether or not they were polygamous, Mormons, or just other residents. And there was an outcry from women suffragists nationally who had become, who well knew the suffragists who had, were leaders in Utah because they had become members of the national suffrage movement. To add insult to injury, a coalition of anti-Mormons managed to get um, what by normal standards was premature statehood for Idaho. And they did so by working with a coalition in Washington to assure them by adding the test oath to the state constitution that when Idaho became a state, the Republican majority in Congress would increase. Does any of this sound somewhat familiar? Those of you who despair over political conflict today need to know it's been there from the beginning. That's better than violence um, better yet would be some way to create a more responsible political environment. And ironically, that happened because of a national crisis, a depression and a heated argument over the gold standard, a cry for economic relief, and the rise of free silver and the populist party which broke the hold of anti-Mormon Republicans in Idaho. Now what fascinated me is I looked very closely, paying a lot of attention to, to dates, those things that students of history uh, find troublesome, but they can come in very handy. What I discovered was that Idaho repealed the anti-Mormon test oath in the same legislative session in which they passed 
a resolution promising to hold a referendum on women's suffrage. That was in January and early February. <clears throat> Excuse me, January um, in early February 1896. I don't believe Idaho repealed the test oath in order to further the cause of women's suffrage, but they did that because of the strong alliance in Utah with the national suffrage movement and the presence of people in Idaho had actually voted in Utah before migrating to the state. The legislature repealed the test out um, as, a, as a way of solving, a, you know, appealing to a variety of voters in the current competitive political environment. But suffragists use that very cleverly to do something very few people were, have been able to do and very few would be able to do for several years after. So here's um, a little bit of evidence of the strong relationship between Latter-day Saint women and the national suffrage movement. This was a photograph taken in the year before, in 1895, after Utah wrote women's suffrage into the state um, pending state constitution. And seated on the front row is Susan B. Anthony. And then um, right behind her is Emmeline B. Wells. And they are surrounded by a wonderful coalition of Latter-day Saint, non-Latter-day Saint, local and national suffragists. It's a kind of model of how the suffrage movement in this period attempted to work by borrowing strength from one area and building it in another. Now this created a very interesting situation in Utah because as I think, uh, as I've already mentioned, and I think as you all know, Abigail Scott Dunaway had done a lot to promote the suffrage cause in Idaho, and she really wanted to lead the campaign in the state. Now, here's an example of how suffragists can also pay attention to politics. Susan B. Anthony tactfully told her that she was needed more in Oregon in order to stimulate action on suffrage there. In truth, Carrie Chapman Catt, who managed the national suffrage campaigns in Colorado and sort of made her mark by the success there, told others that they had to keep Dunaway out of Idaho because she would be likely to offend three constituencies that they absolutely needed in order to pass the referendum. And those were the miners, the Women's Christians Temperance Union, and the Mormons. Dunaway was also an ardent Republican. And she had, in fact, given a major speech at Idaho's Constitutional Convention at the time of statehood in 1890, in which she had assailed the temperance movement and attacked Mormons and polygamy. In the summer of 1895 and 1896, Emma Smith-DeVoe, Laura Johns, and Mary C.C. Bradford, national organizers, toured the state of Idaho. They helped organize multiple suffrage clubs and prepared the way for a month-long visit by Carrie Chapman Catt in August of, of 1896. Cherry Catman Cat spoke 
uh, gave speeches to the conventions of all three political parties in the state and gave many other speeches as well and meetings with influential people. She got rave reviews in the Boise Statesman and in the words of one admirer, aroused Boise to an enthusiasm that was almost phenomenal. But the most important contribution of these national suffragists, in addition to providing some funding, not a lot, some funding, a lot of printed material, was their, their skills that they had been amassing and the, in, including skills derived because of their failures. And they empowered local Idaho suffragists who really pushed the movement forward. I have time here to only talk in a little bit of detail about two of those women. And we can kind of think of them as, um, of the outsiders, not as desperate women, they were willing helpers and they invigorated the local women. So one of my favorites is Martha Jamison Whitman who became president of the Idaho Equal Suffrage Association and she really does look like a parading liberty. She was born in Illinois. She studied at a Presbyterian college in her home state. And then she went west to study at the Kansas Agricultural College and then took agriculture seriously by going alone as a single woman, living for the required time in a little sod house in Nebraska, where she took out a claim under the Homestead Act. She was a single woman when she came to Idaho, but she worked um, as a stenographer and she actually spent time um, copying territorial records at the time of statehood. So she self-educated in Idaho history in that way. What was interesting about her and for a time prevented her from really um, being chosen as president. She wasn't from Ada County where so much of the activity was concentrated. She was from Bear Lake, the absolute heart of the Mormon population. She wasn't a Mormon. She got along with Mormons. And I think she had a lot to do with the fact that the highest margins for women's suffrage in the entire campaign came from the areas of highest Mormon migration. They get credit too because they were well educated, often through their church affiliated relief societies. But, uh, and also the lowest percentage of non voters were in that part of the state as well as in Ada County. There's a fascinating um, newspaper edition um, that came out in June 1896 that was the so-called women's edition of the Idaho Statesman. And what struck me about that um, newspaper was M.J. Whitman's, Martha Jamison Whitman's column on Bear Lake County. I mean, she know, knew how to bring everybody together through the power of her pen. She praised the new um, $2,000 Mormon church school building in Oakley, um, the uh, rising of a Catholic church dedicated in Montpelier. She talked about the drama society. And then she gave a very interesting comment on the equal suffrage clubs in the state, which she said they were booming in the county, the drooping interest having been aroused by the visit of Mrs. Johns of Kansas, one of the national organizers, and Mrs. Richards of Salt Lake City, who was actually 
the person who organized the evil suffrage clubs after the loss of the vote in 1888 and become a powerful younger woman in promoting the cause of suffrage recently passed in Utah. Now the second person, unfortunately, I do not have any images to display, although I'm told on good authority the 19th century Idaho statesman that she was a very beautiful woman. Her name was Melvina Whitney Woods, but she went by the name of Mel. She was born into a polygamous family in Utah in 1850. Her mother was none other than Emmeline B. Wells, the editor of the Woman Exponent. So she was educated in activism and women's rights, and she was old enough to have voted in Utah. She um, married and had a bitter divorce to a man who turned out to be an alcoholic, and then found a wonderful second mate in the person of a non-LDS attorney named William W. Woods, who had lots of business in Idaho, and eventually set up practice in Wallace, Idaho. So when I talk about Mel Woods, we can maybe look at this beautiful image of a place I confess I've never visited and can't wait to do. So what's interesting about Mel Woods is that she was um, in the part of the state that could have been most troublesome for the women's suffrage movement because, again, even this lady had a high proportion of men, it had minors, saloons were important in that part of the state, and there had been trouble elsewhere with that population. I was fascinated to read in the Idaho Statesman that um, Mel Wood's husband was given credit for having brought the Democratic Party of Idaho into the suffrage movement. And they claimed nothing on that scale had ever happened before. And clearly, Mel Woods was behind that move. In a later reminiscence, um, someone described the hard work that she put in working with Emma DeVoe as they would travel to these small areas in the mountains, the highly inaccessible areas. And in one case, they got to a place where their contact who was supposed to meet them had somehow disappeared. They wanted to create a meeting. They didn't know what to do. So they appealed to some local men in the area, something DeVoe couldn't have done on her own who gathered wood, they built a bonfire and held their meeting. She was also very close to Helen Young, the first woman lawyer in Idaho. And Young describes them going uh, to many minor unions and nights of labor clubs where they were very warmly received. Although in the end disappointed, that the vote count in Shokanik County, though it went for suffrage, was not as high as in other states. Now, Emmeline Wells' diary has some dis uh, descriptions of her visit uh, to Wallace and many references to letters from her daughter over this period. Emmeline was terrified at the outbreak of trouble and the strikes and the arson in Coeur d'Alene. And this was interesting to me and made me want to know a whole lot more about the political affiliation of William Woods and whatever role, if any, the supporters of suffrage in the North had played in the recent troubles, which had been resoundly put down with the help of the Pinkertons and others, as you know.
But when Mel Woods went with her mother to the National Suffrage Convention in Iowa in 1897 and was introduced as being from the Coeur d'Alene's, she went out of her way to, to make sure that the women there knew that some of the noblest men in, found anywhere were in that part of the country. And she told them, I fancy few of you know much of the conditions existing in the, in the gulches and the mining camps. There are men from all parts of the world, ignorant and cultured, depraved and respectable, seeking fame and far fortune in the far west. Our suffrage work in such places was obliged to be quietly done, lest they arouse that famous saloon element that the suffragists were worried about. Well, I think the story in Idaho needs to be framed a bit with demographics. You the, the maps the now so common in the United States that identify particular characteristics of population have mapped Idaho in 1880 and 1900. And on these maps, the lighter colored parts of the United States are those approaching equality of men and women in the society. And the darker parts, the really dark green, are places where men compose 75 to 100 percent of the population. And look at the change in Idaho between 1880 and 1900. What is so remarkable to me as you look at that solid dark green in 1880 is that in 1900, which is just four years after the passage of suffrage and must be a very good approximation of the, of the population at the time, there are no totally dark green areas. And in fact, the western, the southern, western and central parts of the state look an awful lot like Utah. And I think there's a lesson there, a really important one, that the suffrage movement was driven by women in alliance with men who wanted to be, quote, improvers and not just exploiters in the American West. Now that's a qualified assumption because I don't know a whole lot about how much exploitation was occurring in the mines in 1896. This was, however, a remarkable peaceful moment of reconciliation facilitated strangely by political competition and suffrage mobilization. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor, for that, for bringing to light some of the uh, women we never hear about, and also, uh, you know, uh, not tying everything up in a neat little bow, because it's not just about one thing, it's about several things. It's about a machine with many cogs working. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is a history that is going to continue to unfold as more research comes out. And in that light and picking up on your last comment about how suffrage wouldn't have happened without men, obviously, I mean, it's the men who had to vote. I wanted to know if you could talk uh, just um, briefly about uh, Dr. Joseph William Morgan. Oh, yeah. The territorial legislature of Idaho, which your great grandfather was in as well. I don't know if they knew each other, but some uh, interesting new uh, information has come out about Dr. Morgan. Explain who he is and 
and what this new find may help us learn. Yes, thank you so much. Um, this is still a developing story, which is why I didn't I didn't mention it, but I'm happy to share with you that his diary has recently been found and the diary of his wife. And there's just an incredible story told by two of his descendants. He, he was in fact a Mormon convert from Wales and his wife from England. They had come into Utah in, in the, under the Mormon um, immigration fund and had then come into Idaho. At some point, he left the church. I don't know when, I would love to know when, for obvious reasons, given the story I've just told. Um, but um, the family story is that when he introduced the idea of suffrage in 1870, and it lost because there was a tie, his wife was so distressed that at the next election, she insisted on going with him and dropping their ballot into the box. So this was a gentleman who tried back in 1870 to introduce the idea of suffrage. Very early. Suffrage. And that, at the time that Idaho and Wyoming, there was a little yeah. flurry of activity in a number of states, including Idaho. But the the threat of the increased Mormon population, most historians believe, um, created caution. It didn't right. become a really big problem until they started winning uh, offices elsewhere. Well, as you mentioned, his diary has been found, um, you know, kept all these, these years, you know, over, yeah. what would it be, 150 years now. Yeah. And so I know that there's a professor over in uh, BYU-Idaho who's working on that. Uh -huh. And yeah. uh, ho hopefully we'll hear more uh, about what's in that, that diary. So we have some questions um, from people. And I just want to note that um, the formal part of this uh, talk is scheduled to end in about 10, 12 minutes. So if you have to go, that's fine. But uh, Professor Ulrich, if you would consider staying for a little bit longer and answering questions, sure. that would be super. So <laughs> Um, we do have some. One, one uh, person writes that, you know, all the s slides that you showed were of white women, and the uh, person wants to know how racially separate was this suffrage movement. And of course, back east, there, there were uh, African American women who were very actively involved in suffrage. But out west, uh, talk about that. Yes. Um, there were, um, you could, uh, so few non-white women in Idaho. I think it was 97% white. Um, where would they have come from? And there were also fewer women of color in the national movement in the East. Um, and Therefore, the people who traveled actually came, most came from the Midwest into Idaho because it was closer. So the charge about um, this, the suffrage movement being a white movement is very misleading. And it grows out of the conflict over the passage of the 15th Amendment. And the, and the split in the national suffrage movement between those who refused to support the 15th Amendment, which as you recall, gave the vote um, to black men uh, recently emancipated and not to women as um, some had intended. Some women supported the 15th Amendment and some didn't. As, as suffragists. And so that um, has kind of been blown out of proportion. The other difficulty is later, um, these early, these movements I'm talking about here in the West, absolutely racial politics because of the Chinese. Chinese, and yeah. The politics I've... over Mexicans and American Indians who were non-tribal, and therefore eligible for citizenship. 
in California. Uh, people use the argument, if you're going to enfranchise non-white men, why can't you enfranchise white women? The issue is not that suffragists were racist. The issue is that the nation was racist. And you have to remember that they're appealing to white men. Yes, I, I noticed uh, when I read some of Abigail Scott Dunaway's um, diary, even when she was, in, I think, in Haley, Idaho, she made a very derogatory comment about oh, a, a well, Chinese she's, person. She's so. a cheap labor because it would allow white women to have careers. Yes. Yeah. So um, I think that you um, talked about this, but maybe a little bit more that how did the temperance movement intersect? with suffrage. Obviously there was a rift and Abigail Scott Dunaway again involved in this because yeah. she didn't she didn't really care that much about uh, temperance and you know if yeah. people wanted to drink. Well, she didn't she didn't want the two <laughs> issues to be aligned. The temperance movement was way bigger than the suffrage movement, as was the women's club movement. And both were very active in Idaho. Suffragists were a little bit to the left and they were much smaller. And so, but the, te the national temperance movement was pro-suffrage, not all local clubs were. And um, Abigail uh, believed that the temperance workers, and they were there in Idaho, um, if, even missionaries coming to preach temperance, were um, offending the miners and therefore uh, they needed to get out. And you saw Mel Wood said, we were very quiet. We didn't want to arouse the saloon element. Mm -hmm. Who yeah, were this man with money and power. Yeah, and it split, it split the, the movement in some ways between women as well. And I know that, um, in one of your other books, you've said, you know, we have to remember there's no universal sisterhood on things. Yeah. <laughs> Women have been on both sides of every revolution. You know, I mean, that would include suffrage. That would include our politics today. We can't look at women as just a block. Yeah. Um, and in, on suffrage, that was the case. You know, there were women who didn't want it or a woman who only wanted it tied with... Yeah. Absolutely, and women are deeply divided today, yes. Um, let's see, I think that this question may have come in before you uh, talked a little bit about it, but the person wanted to know how closely the WCTU did work with suffragists out here. I would maybe uh, extend that question to say, in your view, would suffrage have happened in states like Idaho were it not for the national help that you mentioned in your talk just now? Do you think that was absolutely necessary? I don't know, but one of the undone pieces of research that intrigues me a lot is to know more about those suffrage leaders. Now, here's a little fact that I, I dropped out of my original draft of my talk because I didn't know enough. The Idaho legislature in a session after passage of the referendum elected um, Rebecca Mitchell, who was had been president of the Idaho uh, Women's Temperance Society as their chaplain. So there can't have been a lot of anxiety <laughs> about temperance at that point. And what I want to know is were any of those societies, you know, active um, in mobilization, I suspect there were lots of individual women who were part of those societies who were, but it wasn't much advertised, probably for good reason. One of our questioners says uh, that uh, he or she is amazed that this movement was so nonpartisan, or maybe we can say bipartisan, that it, it crossed over. Um, could you comment on the nature of of that, of different yeah, it's, it's hugely important. Um, they weren't going to get caught in being beholden to any one 
party and and that was just a fact of life so they spoke at all three conventions populists and democrats republicans and amazingly it worked but i suspect it worked <laughs> um because they weren't much of a threat in any serious way to the men who were in power in the legislature. And that's why the whole question of class is so important and it's so different from the East. Um, in the East, the biggest opposition came from often from highly educated upper class women, amazingly. Um, on both sides, both the proponents and the advocates. Women were divided in the East, and that had a lot to do with classes as, as well as with race. Um, sorry, just fancy. Uh, how much do you know about May Arkwright Hutton? She gets a lot of attention in the mining area. She lived there. She became wealthy yes. with her, hus her She's husband early. She's important. I, I hope some enterprising student will work on that because her husband was um, imprisoned in the so-called bullpen. Um, her biography says inadvertently. I could not get a hold of um, any of her papers. Yeah, many um, burnt. Online, many, 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 many but she burnt. moved into Washington State yes. and she also tangled a lot both with Dunaway and, and Emma DeVoe, who mm -hmm. also moved into Washington State. Yeah. My research that, that I did for our documentary shows that uh, she is given, I think, more credit for work in Idaho than she actually did, but she is absolutely essential to suffrage having in, passed in, uh, in Washington State. In Washington. I couldn't the main, find the main activist in Eastern of her. In, in yeah. Um, going back to the Morgan Diary, you know, I think I've piqued the interest of some of these yeah. that are on the line. Could you explain just briefly how that was discovered and when or if other outside researchers might be able to take a look at it? Well, it's in, in the family. Um, and it was found, and this is important and needs to be mentioned, um, Morgan, the two Morgans, Sarah and William, I think was his name, Sarah and William Morgan, their daughter, Harriet, or Hattie, was active in the suffrage movement in Idaho. And, and she, by then, she was a Presbyterian, and she founded um, a relic hall or a little museum in the town of Malad that was just filled with treasures. And apparently what happened when she died, which would have been in, well into the 20th century, um, she was a single woman. Nobody knew what to do with all these things she had left. And um, a, a nephew was asked to come and take a look in the house and, and he, he found the diary under the rug. <laughs> and one of the, these diaries had been kind of hidden away. Um, and he's older now, has those diaries. His daughter, who is very interested in transcribing them and working with them and making them available to researchers, is is going to try to do that, but I, I can't really give that information sure. now. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's just exciting and it shows that um, more information always seems to come yeah. out over time as we decide what things are important to look for. We yeah. find things that help elucidate those topics. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll be wrapping up here uh, for those who need to leave, but there are a few more questions if you don't mind. Sure. Um, how do you think these early victories in Idaho and other Western states um, ended up benefiting women, and certainly women today? Um, you know, do you think that because women had the vote earlier in the Western states, they were able to accomplish certain things 
So uh, I, I did a little um, graphic that I didn't finish. Um, but sadly, um, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming don't line up very well in terms of contemporary political participation. Um, they're in the lower echelon, not, not so true with some of the other Western states. I think it was actually an extremely powerful movement and had a tremendous impact I think it had an impact on my life because what I discovered in these readings um, was a tremendous women's culture of being organized, uh, and, and I think this is appropriate for the Boise City Club. I don't know your history here, but it looks to me like you were involved, and maybe Marilyn, you can comment on this, and recapturing in a moment of later feminism, that spirit of women's cooperative action to make a difference in communities. And that's what this suffrage movement was. I mean, these women went on to become superintendents of public instruction. They did not go on to become U.S. senators and representatives. And in, in fact, William Balderston, the editor and great promoter of women's suffrage, in 1904 wrote an account of what had happened in Idaho and was just thrilled to report that none of the bad things had happened, that women wanted to end men spitting on the streets. They wanted to improve public schools. They wanted to create parks and recreation, and they didn't want to go into public office. So from our perspective, it's pretty conservative. But from their perspective, the notion that in order to improve public education, you had to do more than just whisper in a husband's ear that you really need to, to, to have some kind of institutional power. The clubs provided some of that power through collective action. And as we know, the temperance movement succeeded with prohibition before the suffrage movement passed, succeeded and failed. You know, unfortunately, that movement has given a bad name to the collective efforts of women and, and maybe it should, because I, I want to one, say one thing about the crusade against polygamy. I spent a long time studying uh, plural marriage and women's rights in Utah. And um, nobody today wants to talk about polygamy. <laughs> Non-Mormons, Mormons, nobody wants to talk about polygamy. Um, it became a wedge issue. It was no threat to the nation. <laughs> there were a lot better ways. And I, you know, maybe I'll go out on a limb and say it's a, it was a wedge issue like abortion is today. There are many ways to resolve social conflicts over moral issues, dealing with sexuality, marriage, whatever many ways to do that. But um, disenfranchising people and uh, using the force of the law to force people to be good doesn't always work very well. And that argument could go in lots of different directions. It's a, it's a very finely tuned problem between um, reform and politics. Professor, um, why don't you think that more people in our country, myself included, uh, know this story, know that women in the West with uh, obviously the help of men uh, pass suffrage earlier than the rest of the country? Yeah, why is it's a it's a great question. I when I was growing up, it was almost comic 
you know, Mary Poppins and the mother who leaves her children to go out and campaign for the vote. So women's history comes and goes, and it has a great deal. History is always a dialogue between present and past. And it's very much about the present. And I think it's that um, proto-conservative element of the early suffrage movement that maybe has not allowed historians to take it as seriously mm -hmm. as, as they should. Mm -hmm. And the West just doesn't, sometimes it gets a, a I know, and there aren't as, there aren't as many historians, I, you know, a smaller population, certainly in Idaho, yeah. As we close, um, probably no surprise, we have a question for you about the famous phrase with which you are associated, <laughs> yeah. um, asking what your thoughts are on um, the well-behaved women seldom make history slogan uh, for the feminist movement, this person writes. Does it align with your intention, original meaning? And uh, for those of you who want to learn more, over my shoulder here is a book that Professor Ulrich wrote about kind of her coming to terms as well with that. Yeah, um, yeah. That well, obviously it started out as great fun when it suddenly took off 20 years after I wrote the little sentence in the scholarly article. I mean, I wasn't out to create a movement. But I love the fact that it has empowered so many people. Um, and I think it's great. In fact, I got a little teary when someone forwarded me on Monday of this week an Instagram um, post that had this incredibly sad drawing of uh, Justice Ginsburg in a, a long robe that was um, in, uh, covered with the slogan, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, uh, I I love seeing the creative ways people have used those words, and um, and and totally see it as a powerful slogan because it can be interpreted so many different ways. Yeah, that is very poignant, and in fact, it, uh, somebody asks could you please reflect on Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy for women's rights? Did today, well, she, this is yeah, it, for those listening, this is a day it's when a, she- It's a, I, I read, um, and of course everybody saw the film, <laughs> which was really wonderful for me because I, I spent more than 20 years at Harvard. <laughs> and so I loved, all the Harvard bashing. It's just, you know, it's a cultural thing to want to uh, bring down the men who think they're on top, right? It's a kind of feminist thing. But I also read, um, I think a 500 page, um, legally focused biography on her very, very long career. Um, very complicated legal mind, um, totally and absolutely committed to scholarly and ethical approach to the law. And, the, and it's interesting how she became a pop star, you know, very, very late in life through her courage, basically, I think, her courage. And then the other thing phenomenal about her was she was willing to vehemently disagree with people, but not dismiss them as human beings and to become friends and to share opera with Scalia and all of those things that seem to be missing in so many ways in our contemporary political environment. Do you think that we will see, I've asked you this question, let's see, we started in 2006, <laughs> I think with the first interview I did with you, 2009, 2016, <laughs> yeah. 2020, when will the United States of America see a female president? Uh, well, I thought maybe it was going to happen 
I couldn't believe when the New York Times during the Iowa caucuses uh, picked the three women as the best candidates, and, and they were probably right about that. It's really difficult. It'll happen, but my goodness, the gender dynamics are very deep-seated. Um, and, and maybe, um, maybe what we need to do is maybe focus less on seeing a woman president than focusing more on celebrating the people running for office this week and month and in November in our own local environments and, and really built from at the grassroots, which is what, where most good things happen. Well, thank you for your role, your part in helping celebrate those stories of women who are working so hard. Some of them will never be, you know, on the front page of the newspaper, but they're um, doing yeoman or yo woman's <laughs> work. Um, and Good lives. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which was a, a, a name for an ordinary person in earlier centuries. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you for your work in, in bringing them forward. And thank you for taking the, the time to Zoom in with us. Mm -hmm. um, it's been great to see you, if even virtually. And um, I know we had a lot of people watching as well. So thank you. And for the radio listeners, you've been listening to Professor Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. She taught at Harvard University for many years. She's a pioneer in the study of women's history, winner of a Pulitzer Prize, and a great person. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for including me. Mm -hmm.